The passage with which we're going to begin is Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. This is, of course, in the Decalogue. Decalogue means ten words, which refers to the Ten Commandments. You recognize Exodus 20 as that chapter, the first chapter, that has all of these commandments logged in. Ten commandments, the ten words. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. This is the third lesson in the series that I call Awake, Not Woke. And we're dealing with specifically today what is called the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution in America, the sexual revolution around the world. So let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, and hear what Moses had to say, what God told Moses to write. The first commandment is found in verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No one, nothing in front of God. Commandment number two, and here's where we want to draw attention. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image that would be any sculptured image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above that would be birds, or on earth beneath that would be the land animals, or on the waters under the earth that would be fish not to make any graven image, no sculptured image of any animal, birds, land mammals, fish. Then he goes on to say, you shall not bow down yourself to them or serve them. For I, Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God. Now here's the phrase we want to lock attention to. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing loving kindness unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So let's go back and pick up how God ordered the universe and the thing that he set in motion, that which he set in motion, which we might call the natural consequences of sin. And he tells us very plainly, I, Jehovah, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. What does that mean exactly? It means that sin by nature has a permeating influence. It is aggravated as time goes on. It grows in one succeeding generation after the other. There is a deleterious effect of sin as it progresses in generation after generation. For example, you might think of a pipe. Just, just an iron pipe through which water should flow. And if it begins to rust, it takes some time, but rust begins to form, and pretty soon, over a period of time, the rust actually closes off the pipe, and so very little water can go through. That is the way sin works, not only in an individual, but also in succeeding generations along the line. And we might illustrate it this way. Many people suffer because of the decisions that their parents make or are making or have made. For example, parents make decisions, for example, in which they're going to say, we're not going to be married, and the father's not going to be in the home, but the person who's going to be most struck by the consequences of those decisions are the children in the home growing up without a father. Or it may be that Parents decide to go someplace where there is no church, where there is no religion, where there's nothing honoring God at all, and the children grow up irreligiously. And so they don't have the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Or sometimes it may be that people choose idols, and they do what God forbids them to do, but the succeeding generations, it continues to aggravate, and they add sin to sin, and it becomes more and more grotesque as time goes on. That's the way sin works, and that's the way God establishes it upon the earth. It has a permeating influence that actually soils things worse as time passes. Now, that is not to say that individuals are going to be punished by God in a civil court in the Old Testament for the sins of the fathers. Deuteronomy 24, verse 16 still holds good as far as the Old Testament civil courts were concerned. We are told that the son will not be punished for the iniquity of the father, or the father punished for the iniquity of the son. But the soul that sins, it shall die, Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. So as far as the civil code is concerned, one suffers for his own crimes. 
But as far as sin is concerned, the permeating influence continues to soak and soils things more drastically in the future than it has been in the first generation that chose those steps. The same thing also regarding the judgment bar of God in Romans chapter 4, 14 rather, verses 11 and 12. We are going to be held accountable for our own sins, just as the civil code in Deuteronomy 24, 16, that is the son will not be punished for the sin or the crime of the father, so also it is at the last day, the judgment bar of God. As I live, saith the Lord, to me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I will not stand there with my mother. My mother will not vouch for me. My father will not stand there with me. I will not stand there with my children. I will stand there and I will give an account of how I have lived. And so that holds good. But nevertheless, as far as sin is concerned, the principle is always solid, and that is that the permeation of sin aggravates over a period of time. And that's exactly what's taking place in our country today. That's exactly how God set it up from the very beginning. And that's exactly what takes place regarding what we're looking at, and that is woke ideology and Marxism, which is really Marxism in a new dress, and also what we call now a part of it, the sexual revolution. We saw the sexual revolution explode on the American scene in the 1960s. But now we are beginning to reap the fruits of the seeds that were sown in the 1960s. And that's what's exactly happening in our culture. Let's go back a little bit deeper and dig more into the woke ideology itself. The woke ideology begins with Karl Marx. You're familiar with, of course, as we've already mentioned, Karl Marx's manifesto, the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx not only had the idea that society is all materialistic, there is no spirit in a man, and everything is driven by material considerations only. And so we had a clash that was between the bourgeois and between the proletariat, that is the landowners, the, the factory owners, the shop owners, and the workers. And he wanted a clash to take place, and this clash would bring about a new civilization. But he was interested in violence, and I say that, and I want to underscore that, because there are many people today, professorships at colleges and universities, who are telling the children that no, Marx was all about peace, and the violence came in with Val Vladimir Lenin. And that is, of course, bunk. Karl Marx plainly said, here's his biographer, Robert Payne, 1968, wrote the definitive study on Karl Marx. Marx had a devil's view of the world and the devil's malignity. Sometimes he seemed even to know that he was accomplishing the works of evil. Absolutely. That's exactly when you read Karl Marx. So also in the manifesto, he tells us right in his seminal work, the manifesto, he was striving for and he wanted a communist revolution to forcibly overthrow existing institutions. He was about violence and the communists were all about violence in order to bring about that clash. Again in 1849 Marx wrote this, when our turn comes we shall not make excuses for the terror. And then once again there's only one way in which the murderous death agonies of the old society and the bloody birth throes of a new society can be shortened, simplified, and concentrated. And he said, here's how we're going to do it. Revolutionary terror. He attached himself and his followers attached themselves to every revolutionary movement in Europe and began to overturn existing institutions by violence and mayhem. That's exactly what he stood for. And his compadre in all of this was Friedrich Engels, who said socialism cannot be brought into existence without revolution. They called themselves scientific socialists. Now, the reason he did that, incidentally, was because he saw Charles Darwin's work, which came out almost at the same time as his. Charles Darwin, supposedly scientific, talked about the evolutionary ascent of man. And so evolution is that supposed mechanism that brings us all about Karl Marx liked that, and so he said he called himself a scientist because of that, but he was a socialistic scientist, and so he called himself a socialist scientist. And then Friedrich Engels said this, and here's a part of the program, and that is unrestrained sexual intercourse. That's what they wanted. So let's move ahead just a moment. 
we move down the timeline to Herbert Marcuse, mentioning him last week, which was literally one of the leading lights of the Frankfurt School. Now, the Frankfurt School in Germany was established in the 1930s. They were thoroughgoing Marxists. They wanted to overturn society. However, because of Hitler's Germany in the 1930s, they realized that they could not stay there in Germany, and so they moved with the help of John Dewey, the father of American education, no less. We'll talk about him some more next week when we talk about education, Lord willing. They came to New York, and they set up shop at what is now called Columbia University. And Herbert Marcuse, the leader of the Frankfurt School, said, we're going to take Marxism, but we're going to add more than simply the bourgeois and the proletariat, the owners and the workers. We're going to add race and gender. And we want a clash between races, and we want a clash between genders. Clash between the blacks and the whites, the Hispanics and the whites, and we want a clash between men and women. And so that's the idea that they had. The Frankfurt School is all about that. So I want to ask this question. And they, in all of this, they targeted the family. They wanted to get rid of the family. Karl Marx spoke about a community of women in the manifesto. That is, there is not going to be any family, and women will belong to all the men, and that was the community of women. And he defended that as to say, well, Look at you, who you people are. You, some of you are committing adultery, so we're going to have a community of women. And they targeted the family. They needed to eradicate the family structure in order for Marxism to advance. And I want you to see why that is the case. And there's several reasons. Number one, because the family is a sacred institution. The family, of course, has its origin in God. Genesis 2, verse 24 Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Here, the family is ordained and organized and begun by God. And people who are in a family situation are honoring God when they have a family after that order. They're honoring God by having family associations. And that has got to go because atheism is the keystone of all Marxism. So they have to get rid of the family because that is an honoring of God institution. And we're never going to be able to progress with the so-called community of women if indeed there is a family structure in place. But they discovered something else pretty interesting. And that is that they found that people are content in a family. They're not going to be able to irritate people and make them hypersensitive to real or supposed oppressions in their lives. That's what woke ideology is, to make people hypersensitive to all of the supposed oppressions that you faced. And so if you faced oppression in any way, they want to rub you raw with it, and they want people to be so angry about the oppression that you yourself have had, or your grandparents, or people down the line, way back yonder have had. And they want to make everybody divided among, along those lines. For example... I was speaking to a black woman just about two or three years ago, and I, just in casual conversation, I've referred to her as a gal, just with another, other gals, and she unloaded on me with full force. She was so angry about that. She says, that's what they called the slave women back in the 1800s. See, they, everybody's irritated. Everybody stays irritated. And you have to watch what you say because we're going to go back to the slave days and say that's how some white people talked about black women. And so she ran off in a huff and she was just yelling, yelling at me. And she was a member of the Church of Christ. Now that's what's happening in our society. But Marx, Marcuse found that people were basically content in a family. There's contentment. And no matter how much they wanted to rub you raw... The wives were going to stay in a family situation. The husbands were going to stay there. They wanted to be faithful to the wives. The children wanted to obey their parents. And that is a hierarchical situation that they were not going to live with. And contentment is the opposite of what they want. They want revolutionary feelings. They want everybody to be angry with one another. Contentment. By the way, you might note the passages in the New Testament that show that there is contentment. Remember what Paul had to say? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, if any man teaches a different doctrine 
consents not to sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows nothing but doting about questionings, disputes of words where there comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, wranglings of men corrupted in mind and bereft of the truth, supposing that godliness is a way of gain. But now hear what he says. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, neither can we carry anything out. But having food and covering, we shall be there with content. We pay a heavy price for discontentment in our society. But it is the nuclear family that gives contentment to a person. It gives integrity to a person. It gives dignity to people. And that's exactly what Karl Marx, Herbert Marcuse, the sex and revolution, and race and gender divisions and biases, that's what they did not want, contentment. And so the family has got to go. And then you have, there's something else regarding the family that they particularly despised. And that is, there is a hierarchy of authority in a family. The Bible still tells us, still teaches us, in spite of what many people want to believe, even, unfortunately, in the Lord's church, that the head of every man is Christ, the head of Christ is God, and the head of the woman is the man. And now that's the order that God gives. That's a hierarchy. God, the Father, Christ the Son, man and woman. And when we overturn that, or we disregard that, and we thumb our nose at the hierarchy that God has established and what leadership and authority means in a family, then we are in serious trouble. And that's what's happened in our society. But Marx, Engels, Herbert Marcuse, the woke ideologist of the Frankfurt School, they realized that the hierarchy system where people are honoring authority, respecting authority that is above them, has got to go. You cannot have that. You can't have respecting authority at the same time, revolution in the streets. And that's what's going on in our society right now. You can see it, can't you? It's exactly what we see. So this passage they despised also, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and following. Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents. This is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now note the hierarchy. The father, the mother, and the children. And that is reflective of the hierarchy or the respect for authority that we learn in society. You show me children who disrespect the law or teachers in the school, and I will show you a child who disrespects his parents. That's exactly what Marx wanted. That's exactly what Herbert Marcuse, the woke ideologist, want. They want society to be unraveled, and they want disrespect for authority. And that's exactly what we're seeing on the streets. And then lastly, the whole thing, the whole family structure, the Christian family is a preventive of all of these things. Because after all, a person's solace, a person's comfort, when we get into society and the ugliness of society, a person's comfort is at home with a wife and children. And people find fulfillment in that, in all of that family structure that God has originated and ordained is a preventive. And that's exactly what many people in the woke ideology movement or those, that is the Marxist movement, that's what they knew. Consequently, the family has got to be eradicated. And so they all, from one Marx all the way down, even before that, we'll see in just a moment, they said the family has got to be eradicated. For example, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a Marxist movement the leaders were trained by Marxists and people in the Weather Underground, a communist organization of which, remember, Bill Ayers was a member in the 1960s. And so the leaders of it, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tamidi, Alicia Garza, they all declare they are trained Marxists. They say that out loud and openly. 
And on the front page of the website, it used to be this, they wanted to eradicate the nuclear family. And I am shocked, dismayed, discouraged, and frankly irritated that so many of our own preachers and Christians in the Lord's church have not informed themselves enough to recognize that it's doing the devil's work because they will say that we are part of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's a Marxist organization that is intent on destruction of the family. That's what it is. And the leaders of it say that out loud. And yet we have become so uninformed on what's happening that we have preachers in the pulpits of the Church of Christ siding with Black Lives Matter. It's absolutely astounding to me. But that's what's happening. So let's look at the importance of a family to a culture. We'll back up just a moment and look at a man who's a sociologist in the 1930s, and his name is J.D. Unwin. And he wrote a book in 1936 called Sex and Culture. It was a lengthy study for many, many years he conducted it. And his study was in 84 different countries. And he used different metrics in order to determine what the relationship was between a nuclear family or at least what he called prenuptial chastity, that is chastity before marriage, and monogamy and the flourishing of a culture. What is the relationship between monogamy, that is a culture that honors monogamy, one husband, one wife, for life, a culture that honors that and honors that we're going to be chaste before marriage. What is the relationship of that and the flourishing of that culture? And after many, many years of study through different metrics, he used art, architecture, education, engineering. He looked at engineering. He looked at science. All these different metrics. And he determined this, J.D. Unwin. And here's his book. You can look it up. Find his book. He says, here's what I've discovered. He said that when a culture honors monogamous marriage and prenuptial chastity, that culture flourishes. But when a culture disregards that with sexual immorality, it is about three generations from unraveling completely. Now, that's a sociologist in 1936, an anthropologist. Now, today in anthropology departments, you're not going to read that kind of stuff at all. But that was a lengthy study. And he said this, if there was a societal change also in the norms regarding sexual restraint, either toward more sexual freedom or toward greater sexual restraint, the full effect of that change was not realized unto the third generation. Now, where have we read that before? Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation, exactly what Unwin said he discovered was the case. In other words, it takes at least three generations for the corrosive effects of sexual immorality to have its heyday on a culture and destroy that culture, disintegrate that culture from the inside and turn it about if, they, if that culture honors monogamous marriage and honors prenuptial chastity, then over a period of time it takes about three generations and that culture flourishes. And the flourishing of that culture is in the third generation. Remarkable, isn't it? Almost the fulfillment of a prophecy. But there's more. Kirk Dunst Durston, who was a Unwin scholar, says this, rationalist cultures that retain this combination, and he's speaking about prenuptial chastity, monogamous marriage, exceeded all cult other cultures in every single area, literature, art, science, architecture, engineering, agriculture. Why has America been great? This is why. We are founded upon God-given principles and at the beginning, at least, we honored monogamous marriage. We honored prenuptial chastity. That's not to say that everyone lived perfect lives, but it is to say that was the cultural norm. Now it is not. But here's something even more astounding. Rational thinking. 
Here's what Unwin said. This is from, quoted from Noel Maring's book, Awake Not Woke. She makes the statement. Unwin discovered there was a deep correlation between prenuptial chastity and absolute monogamy and rational thinking. Rational thinking. When the first was abandoned, the rational thinking disappeared within three generations. It's exactly what we're seeing in our society, isn't it? And now we have people say, well, I want you to call me a woman, even though I'm a man, or vice versa. And everybody else has to bow down and do exactly the same, or they're going to be punished by some institution if they don't do that. We've lost our way. This is woke ideology. That's what's happening in our culture, isn't it? So let's look at, backing up even further, the history of communism's anti-family agenda. And I'm just going to mention these individuals. The first man is Robert Owen. Robert Owen was in the 1820s. Actually, he was a Welsh uh, engineer, a Welsh, uh, li uh, Welshman, and he came to the United States and he set up communes in which there would not be chastity, there'd be no wives. Robert Owen, incidentally, an atheist, debated Alexander Campbell in 1829 in Cincinnati, Ohio. The same Robert Owen. Listen to what Robert Owen has to say. This is a part of, and he was a socialist, and this is a part of socialism. This is ingrained right in it, part of, the, part of the woodwork of it. I now declare that man up to this hour has been in all parts of the earth a slave to a trinity of the most monstrous evils that could be combined and to inflict mental and physical evil upon the whole race. He says God's evil. I refer to private or individual property, absurd and irrational systems of religion, and marriage founded upon individual property, combined with some of these irrational systems of religion. What has he said? He said marriage, a family that you all talk about, is founded upon property rights. And that property rights, those rights must go. There is no mom, dad, and the kids anymore. And so he said we need to set up a commune. He set up a commune, several of them, in the United States. They failed miserably. Socialism does not work. But people today are very lacking in looking back and seeing where these things have failed. But nevertheless, Robert Owen tried it. Didn't work. Here's something else. This is Charles Fourier in France, of course, in about 1870s. He was the one who termed the coin feminism. He advocated sadomasochism, incest, and bestiality, and to get rid of all sexual mores. That was part of the program. That was a socialist who preceded Karl Marx. How about the Communist Manifesto itself? It speaks of a community of wives. Karl Marx wanted to set up exactly as Robert Owen had. No wife belonged to any husband. Free range and all the women. Karl Marx himself lived that way. He raped his own maid in the house. Her name was Lincoln, L-E-N-C-H-E-N. -E -E she had a child. He refused to take care of it. And Friedrich Engels was having to take care of that child the rest of his life. And incidentally, talk about the workers of the world unite. Lincoln was in his house, and he never paid her a dime. Not a dime. Workers of the world need to be rising up against those who are controlling them. Hypocrisy is built into the system. He never paid her a penny. Frederick Engels lived with two women, sisters. So also other leaders of the communist movement, Joseph Stalin, known to have taken many, women's, uh, many women and husbands' wives. So also with Joseph, uh, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, all of those men. They took other people's wives. They had free reign. As a matter of fact, there was a magazine that was published not long ago, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but it pointed out the sexual immorality that took place in the Bolshevik Revolution. And they said that their sexual lives were as casual as dogs. Is that how we pe people want to live? Is that what we want in America? That's what they want. That's exactly what they want. As a matter of fact, this man, Leon Trotsky, said undoubtedly sexual oppression is the main means of enslaving a person. While such oppression exists, and he's speaking about marriage, there can be no question of real freedom. Like the family, uh, the family, like a bourgeois institution, has completely outlived itself. The family must go. So he said. So also, Georgi Lukacs, who was neo-Marxist, 1930s, the Frankfurt School, the woke ideologist, Leo, 
man we mentioned last week, he was all about sex and revolution. So also this man, Willy Munzenberg, who founded the Communist International, or part of the Communist International, same period, post-World War I. Willy Munzenberg hated Christianity, as they all do. He hated the Old and New Testament, and he basically set himself to attack the Bible completely. And this is part of the Frankfurt School of Woke Ideology, which embedded itself at Columbia University and is now spreading all through the country. And then this man, Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich was a Jew. He grew up also with the same ideas regarding sexuality. And he himself said, what we have to do, and he was interested in the education, educational program. We have to be able to get it into the education of the kids in school in America. And he called it basically a Trojan horse. Get sexual, sexuality, sex education in the schools. And you know what? That's exactly what's happening in our society today. Wilhelm Reich. Why were they doing this? Because they wanted to overturn American society. That's why they're about revolution. And that's what they did. Now let's talk about the sexual revolution today for a few moments. In the 1960s, Lyndon B. Johnson began what was called, not the welfare society, even though that it was, he called it the great society, but it was a welfare system. And he particularly was interested in giving welfare to African American families. And so from the 1950s, things changed when he came into the 1960s, where he had huge, huge welfare programs pumping out hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars into the black communities. But he had an aide in his office, and this man is the one, Dan Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Moynihan would later be a congressman, I believe, but he was a sociologist working for LBJ. And he began studying the African-American family in America. And he was alarmed at the statistics that he was looking at. And he found out that the welfare program, the pumping of money into the black family, was actually driving the husbands out of the home and the fathers out of the home. Not only so, but they were, they were practicing abortion already. And there's not any family integrity. The integrity of the family, of the African-American family specifically, was breaking down. And he said, now some of it may be caused by racism of the past, but he says it goes much deeper than that. So he went to LBJ and told him his discovery. And LBJ's, Lyndon Johnson's remedy was simply to pour more gasoline on the fire. He got up at Howard University and said, what we need to do is we need to subsidize the black family even more with the welfare program. And what have been the results? Today, Three out of four black children are born without fathers in the home. In Hispanic homes, it's about 50%. In Caucasian white homes, it's about 33%, about one-third. That's basically how it breaks down. The same thing regarding abortion. Abortion takes place along the, basically the same line. 75% in the African-American community, 50% in the Hispanic community, and 33% in the white Caucasian. And all of it's growing right now as we speak. But as Moynihan pointed out, he thought it was because of pouring the money into those families and into that society, the welfare program itself was to blame. He's exactly right. And that's exactly where we are today. This woman, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, post-World War I, founder or foundress of Planned Parenthood, she made no bones about it. It's amazing that Planned Parenthood would still have federal dollars, your dollars, going to it. She founded it, and she said it was to eradicate the black family. We have too many minorities, and we need to get rid of them. That's the reason it was founded. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example, who is an icon to the left. You know, a person who makes this comment, this kind of a comment, on the right would never even see the light of political day on the other side, would they? She said regarding Roe versus Wade, which was recently overturned, that was intended to control population growth. And here's what she said. Particularly growth in populations that we don't want to have too many of. Shocking, isn't it? That's the sexual revolution. Here's the show that appeared, I guess it started about 
10, 15 years ago called Mad Men. And it featured a woman by the name of Joan and another woman by the name of Peggy. And they go to work in an office with a lot of men. And they're the women. The first episode, just to give you a, a thermometer of where we are in our culture, shows that Joan takes Peggy to the doctor so she can be put on the pill that she might have physical relations with any man that she wants without the responsibility of children. That's where we are. Meaningless sexual contact. Meaningless. Here's a magazine called The Cut. Several years ago had a woman writing in. This is heart-rending. She said, I was always painfully aware of the fact that the only reason these guys, and she said she had been, about, about, had been on about 30 to 40 dates within the last two years. She said, I, I was painfully aware of the fact that the only reason these guys were talking to me because I was letting them sleep with me. I felt like a sex doll. I tried to ignore the feelings, but nothing worked. So much for feminism, huh? So much for women power, because what happens is, when this takes place, women are treated like trash. And when abortions take place, women have to go to councils because they recognize there's something instinctive in a woman that says that I've killed my baby. And they're not getting by very, very easily with it. The woman's movement is about the man. He has released himself from all responsibility of being in the home, of being a father to children. That's what it's about. And it is sad to see in America. You know this woman? Listen, Milano, she made this comment just two or three years ago. She said, we're going to go on a sex strike. Why? If you don't give us abortion, then we're going to go on a sex strike. We're not going to have relations with any men anymore. She said, perhaps more than she really intended to say with that, because it does show one thing, doesn't it? People have self-control over their own bodies. People can maintain themselves and maintain their purity by self-discipline. She can do it when the cause is right. And people can today, too. All of us can. I was in a school board meeting just a couple of three years ago. I don't know, maybe it was about five or six years ago at WFISD. And I was sitting in the school board meeting before it began, and we were, some of us were chatting, and there's an African-American woman sat behind me. She was an exceeding liberal, and she, we were talking about abortion, and friendly conversation, but she made this comment finally. She said, well, if you don't give us abortion, she says, if you make us have our children, make us have those children, then you're going to help take care of them. I didn't have, I didn't have uh, the backbone to say, as I should have, there is another option, and that is practice chastity. <laughs> practice chastity. That's not the other option. The other option, that is, me take care of your child. No, you practice chastity. Here's what one woman wrote in the same magazine. If abortion is illegal, then men abandoning their child should be also illegal. That's exactly right. If this was a permanent decision for me, that is talking about not access to abortion, then it should be for you as the father also. That's exactly right. Exactly. That's where we are as a culture. The sexual revolution has taken us by storm from the 1960s to the 1990s. And according to Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, it will be upon the third and the fourth generation. What is a generation as far as time frame is concerned? A generation is perhaps 20 to 30 years. If the sexual revolution, which began in the 1960s, where the neo-Marxism the Frankfurt School and the woke ideology began to take flower and plant the seeds have been planted before and now it's beginning to blossom. And if we take three or four generations after that, we're about right now at the point of where the iniquity of the fathers are going to be born upon the children. That is the succeeding generations. It's exactly what's happening in our country. We need once again to honor what the Bible teaches regarding marriage. Remember, the Pharisees came to Christ and said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? What did Jesus answer? Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? They are no more two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man divide, or let no man put asunder. They said, well, why then did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement? Deuteronomy law. 
to put her away, to divorce her. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered or allowed you to put away your wife, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. And he that marries her which is put away commits adultery. That puts the lock on wedlock, doesn't it? That shows us that the marriage is an institution not only ordained by God, but if we're going to honor God, we're going to honor His guidelines for marriage. And we need to permeate the culture as best we can for godly principles in our society. What we're seeing today is really the results. We're bearing the fruit of the seeds that have been planted many years ago. The lesson is yours. If you want to restore your life to Christ, now's an opportunity to do that. Or if you are who is one who is not a Christian by faith, repentance, baptism into Christ. You can put Christ on in baptism. Galatians 3 verse 27. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But there's a war out there and we need to help one another along the way. We want you to come right now if you're subject to the invitation while we stand and sing.